Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. The man said to Rebekah and her household, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become wealthy. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live. But you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will only make successful the way I am going. I am standing here by the spring of water. Let the young women who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, Please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw water for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, Please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will also water your camels. So I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, 
If you will deal loyally and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, so that I may turn either to the right hand or to the left. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will. So they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse, along with Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahai Roy and was settled in the Negev. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field. And looking up, he saw camels coming. And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. The word of the Lord. Song. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness. The Lord is loving to everyone, and his compassion is over all his works. All your works praise you, O Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. They make known the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power that the people may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all ages. The Lord is faithful in all his works and wonderful in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all those who fall down and lifts up those who are bound. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer that I do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer that I do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law in my mind making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all ye that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you are familiar with the Harry Potter series by J.K. Rowling, you may know one of its unexpected heroes, Dobby the House Elf. Early in the series, Dobby is enslaved by one of the most notoriously evil families, the Malfoys. As a result, he hears a lot of things that he shouldn't. He knows the plots that are being hatched by those who seek to harm Harry Potter. And since house elves are beneath notice for most families, there is no need to censor one's fate behavior around them. Their loyalty is assumed and required. We learn early on that house elves are not able to act of their own free will. They must obey their masters without question or suffer terrible and immediate consequences. Dobby, the house elf, has a good heart and longs for freedom. He is aware early on that he wants to be helpful to the bearer of the good in the novels none other than Harry Potter. There is a cost in his early attempts to be helpful. He goes to extreme lengths to let him know that he's in danger. But as soon as Dobby shares anything that could be considered disloyal to his masters, he has to begin physically harming himself. He slams himself against the walls. He looks for objects to bang himself with. It turns out all house elves have to punish themselves whenever they do something that is contrary to the laws that their masters have set out. As the novels progress, Dobby is able to move from this enslaved state to one of greater freedom. Harry frees him from the Malfoy family using a ruse, which we don't need to get into those details. But the more important journey 
is about what it is to be truly free. Dobby has to learn what freedom is. He has to wrestle with the lack of understanding the other house elves have for him for his life away from the rigors of enslavement. He wants wages, but he seems to understand that too much money might be a danger to him. He takes joy in the smallest things, clothes in particular, because house elves are not allowed to possess them. Eventually, towards the end of the saga, he rescues Harry Potter and his friends from dire straits and makes the ultimate sacrifice of his life for his friends. Those scenes of Dobby and the other house elves, though, having to punish themselves, the instant they transgress an order, though, sticks with you. What would it look like to us if every time we did something wrong or against the rules, we immediately were aware of it, and then we outwardly demonstrated our guilt by physically throwing ourselves on the floor against the walls or looking for objects to bang our heads with? I suspect our regular meetings might get a good bit more interesting. (laughs) St. Paul tells us this morning, I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer that I do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what is due. Now what I do, now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be the law that when I want to do good, evil lies close at hand. This passage that we hear from Romans this morning has often been misunderstood, by, especially by modern hearers. Since most of us are not terribly familiar with Greek rhetorical conventions of the time, It's easy to slip into hearing this as some great inner struggle that Paul has decided to share with us. We might even be led to believe that he has felt as imprisoned by the demands of the law as a house elf who has only found freedom and relief by shedding that way of life. Some Protestant reformers continued this light of thought, notably Martin Luther, who seemed to be so undone by a compulsion to follow the law perfectly he found only grace was available for relief. The only problem with this line of thought as it relates to Paul is he doesn't actually appear to think that following the law is the problem. He knew he was able to follow it and to follow it well, but he still thinks grace is necessary. So what's going on? If this passage isn't about Paul's need to confess his inner struggle to us or as an encouragement to abandon the law altogether, what's up? New Testament scholar Luke Timothy Johnson suggests that Paul's use of the first person is to serve as a mirror of our own reflection and self-examination. We are not invited to look deep within Paul's psyche, but perhaps our own. Now, after hearing those words again, it's a rather harsh look inside, isn't it? I hope most of us can approach our limits with a more compassionate gaze than we hear from Paul this morning. But I also suspect all of us, at one time or another, is utterly flummoxed by our own lack of progress, our inability to be more kind and compassionate, and we simply want to scream with frustration at our limits. Johnson suggests that the heart of the problem for us in the law, according to Paul, is not that we can't follow it, but that it is unable to prevent us from experiencing the alienation that comes to us through life as a human being encountering sin. The law can help us understand what will create a healthy life relationship between God, the creation, and one another, but it simply cannot guarantee that we will do it. We still do things and leave things left undone that prevent us from fullness of life. Otherwise, we wouldn't say the confession every week, would we? Some days we receive our human limits within ourselves with compassion. Other days we are more apt to punish ourselves harshly and lament our lack of progress. Ultimately, we can make anything a source of idolatry, 
putting it in the place of a loving God, even good things like the law. If the law is leading us to draw more deeply on God, it is a good thing. If it prevents us from acting with compassion and love and justice, we've missed the point. Paul knows that any idol does not allow us to access the living power of God and ultimately leads to death. So we are called to put ourselves in relationship with Christ, who leads us into that kind of freedom. It is not an abandonment of the law, but a fulfillment of its true purpose. It's similar to the invitation we hear in the gospel this morning. Jesus invites us to yoke ourselves to something that offers us a different way of moving forward. It is not the hard slogging that comes from imagining it is all up to us. It is the freedom we find when we release ourselves into the deeper care of God's love and compassion. It is a freedom that still has structure, but the purpose of the structure is to keep us grounded in God. It is not an end in itself. We know the structure and we reaffirm it every time we baptize new Christians. Prayer and worship, study of scripture, receiving the gift of God's very presence in the Eucharist and serving others. Structure is a gift when it points us towards God and neighbor. We cannot function in a vacuum or without community. The structure is what allows us to move forward in true freedom, not freedom from, but freedom for. Freedom for our neighbor, freedom for our God. When we are freed from the compulsion of self-preservation and self-centeredness, that is when we start to find the fullness of life that God desires for us. One that connects us more fully with a God in others and throughout all creation. That is a yoke worth choosing. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate for the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. For all people in their daily life and work. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. 
for the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Anglican Church of Burundi. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we give thanks for immigration and refugee ministries in West Texas. We pray for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, David, David and, Ray, and Rayford, our bishops, and for our, all our bishops and other ministers. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially Doug Addington, Kim Alexander, Gary Brauner, Ruth Berink, Joyce Carruthers, Janet De La, Garcia, De La Carrejo, Tony Corbett, Marty Dunkley, Charles Field, Nelda Greer, Jenny Halter, Patricia Hammond, Marion Holdsworth, Nancy Jackson, Carl, Sherry Lachman, Richard Lynch, Martin Mendoza, Megan Menares, Jim Pearson, Clyde Phelps, Paul Pineda, R. Jared Ray, Kathy Robinson, Olive Rowan, Christine Salito, Leslie Todd, Carol Wade, Molly Zachary. And for those with long-term concerns, Ainsley Baird Brown, Joseph Brumlick, Janice Delara, Tim Finan, Karim Foda, Brooks Freeland, Gloria Guzman, Alice Haney, Anna Jane Hayes, Kev, Nikki Marriott, Nicole McNeil, Sarah, the Order of Ursuline Sisters in Ukraine, Sharon Cottonwood, Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. For our long-term partners in ministry, Christian Assistance Ministries, Good Samaritan Community Services, Morningside Ministries, SAM Ministries, and Crockett Academy through communities in schools. We will exalt you, O King, our, O God, our King. And pray. We pray for all those who have died, especially Marjorie Cook Hutchinson, Bob LeClaire, that they may have a peace in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful God.
Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. It is a pleasure to welcome you to St. Mark's today, whether you're here in person or joining us online. We are so glad you're here. If you're visiting, we hope you'll take a minute and fill out a, visiting, a visitor card so we can be in touch with you about ways to get connected in our community. Matt is continuing his sabbatical, though he is joining the choir over in Edinburgh, and we have had news that they have landed safely, so they will begin their residency there uh, in a few days. Um, Anne is on vacation, and so we give great thanks for uh, Doug Earl celebrating with us today and Ed Rieke, our organist emeritus, on the bench. So we can make things happen here. So thank you to both of them. <laughs> we also give thanks in our diocese for the ordination of our new bishop, uh, coadjutor. If you want to know more about these fancy terms, feel free to talk to me in the narthex. I can unpack them for you. Uh, but we made a new bishop in the church yesterday at TMI, and we celebrate with our diocese. Um, we will actually have a wonderful opportunity in December uh, to host an even song here at St. Mark's, and that will be when the crozier, which is the funny stick they carry around, will be officially passed from the current bishop to our new bishop. So stay tuned for information about that. It'll be a wonderful service uh, to do that as well. But we'll be praying for a lot of Davids throughout the summer, so just <laughs> join us for that. Uh, we will have a coffee hour immediately following this service, and it includes a table the, with the bookstore. So please, if you'd like to join us for some fellowship afterwards, just turn to the right, to the left, and you'll find Gosnell Hall. Uh, we are looking to update the directory uh, coming up soon. So if you have a very old directory picture, feel free to take a casual shot of yourself sometime uh, during the summer so that when we get ready to do that, we can invite you to update that. Uh, we are stuffing the bus, as we do every year, with school supplies for Crockett Elementary. So if you look at the back of your service leaflet, that'll have a, a list of things that we are collecting on behalf of that. Finally, if you have received a strange email from me, uh, you are not alone. Uh, unfortunately, people like to clone email addresses. This is not the same as being hacked. If you get an email that's from bnolton at stmarks-sa.org, that is actually from me. If you get one that's from Rev Beth B. Knowlton, uh, at Gmail, that means some wonderful person has decided to go and um, imitate me. I mean, I'm worthy of imitation, but still. <laughs> the main thing you need to understand is I will never, ever, ever, and let me just say this, I will never, ever send you an email that says, I have an urgent request for you, but I'm about to go into a meeting, so don't call. Um, these are just ways that people are trying to take advantage of you, so please just feel free to delete. If it is a Gmail address, please feel free to report it to Google, which we've done, but accept our apologies. If we were in charge of all of those things in the world, it would be a better world, but we are not. So anyway, just know that I will never approach you that way uh, for money. So anyway, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> that's all I know about that. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God.
be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross, and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this, for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. These are holy things for holy people. They are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the blessing of the God of Abraham and of Sarah and of Jesus Christ, born of our sister Mary, and of the Holy Spirit who broods over the world as a mother over her children, be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.